traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. You're battling your way through a sea of grasses. You're a good fighter, trained from a young age, but the barbarian riding fast towards you is better. He is on horseback, riding without saddle or stirrup, clad in the clothes of his tribe, pants, long sleeves, and a pointed cap. No, you see now, it's not a he at all, but the sight is so strange to you that it takes a moment to understand. The warrior heading toward you is a woman. She and her horse are both decked out in gold, moving together as one fearsome creature. You watch her twist around and shoot a man behind her clean through with her bow and arrow, swift and brutal. It doesn't even slow her down. Terror fills you because she's turning now and her eyes have locked on you. Even in your fear, you can't help but marvel at her. Strong, wild, and merciless, so different from the good Greek women you grew up with more than willing to bring her blade crashing down. And just before she does, you gasp, waking up in your bed back in Athens. This isn't the first time you've dreamt of the Amazons, and it's not likely to be the last. The ancient Greeks told lots of stories about Amazon women, the mythic bands of warrior ladies that Heliconos of Lesbos described as a host of golden-shielded, silver-axed, man-loving, boy-killing females. They made up fantastic stories about both loving and subduing these women who were bold, violent, promiscuous, and independent. Everything a good Greek wife was never supposed to be. To many, they were a fantasy, equal parts exciting and terrifying. And for a long time, scholars thought that that was all they were, a figment of the Greek imagination. But now we understand that the ancient world saw its fair share of warrior women, living on the move, hunting and fighting, living and dying on their own terms. It turns out the Amazons were quite real. But who were these women the Greeks saw in their pleasant dreams and worse nightmares? Let's go hunting beyond the myths and legends and try to join up with them if we can. Grab a bow and arrow, some golden bangles, and your best leather chaps. Let's go traveling. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons. My pirate queens, Mikkel, Jackie, Gaia, Anna, Wendy, Kayla, Jessica B., and Emily. My lady presidents, Caroline, Caitlin, Louisa, Amy, Brendan, Paul, Elizabeth G., Kat, Nancy, Eve, Claire K., Courtney, Casey, Jordan, Debbie, Pamela, Sasha, Cassie, Townsend, Ellie, Jessica S., Meg, Edie, Audrey, Lauren, Karen R., Dana, Lori, Larissa, Belinda, Nicole, Claire S., and Elizabeth M. And here's to the gods and goddesses divine who are contributing more each month than I've asked for. Jackie C., Alexis, Karen C., and Avery. By becoming a patron for as little as $1 a month, you get access to exclusive bonus episodes, sneak peeks, and more. And help me keep the Explores going. To check it out, head to my website and click on Become a Patron. Before we part the Greeks' mythological curtain, let's set the scene with some of their legends about the Amazons to try and understand how they see them. They're clearly fascinated by them, and threatened, and lusty. Sometimes it's a fine line between the two. Though the Amazons are considered barbarians, women from outside the bounds of Greek culture, they also have a legend about one of their own. Once upon a time, King Iasos of Arcadia crossed his fingers that his newborn child wouldn't be a daughter. When he found himself handed one, he decided it was best to leave her on a mountainside to fend for herself. Thanks, Dad. Luckily, a mother bear happened by and adopted her, bringing her up in her wild, dangerous world. When some hunters came upon her years later, she was a wild and feral thing, a natural predator who needed no one. 
She could hunt better than any man around and wasn't afraid to do it topless. With naked breasts, she carried her weapons, wrote one guy, and did not blush. Like Artemis, the Olympian virgin huntress we met in our latest bonus episode over on Patreon, Atalanta loved nothing more than to go roaming alone in the woods with her bow and arrow. She wasn't about to let any man threaten her independence of either body or spirit. So when a couple of centaurs try to assault her, she does what Artemis would have. She shoots first and asks questions later. See ya, centaurs! She is so famous for her ferocity that a guy named Meliager invites her to come on an expedition to hunt down the terrible Caledonian boar. This isn't just any old boar. It's a beast sent by an angry goddess to ravage the land, and Meliager is rounding up the burliest and bravest heroes to try and kill it, including Jason and his Argonauts and Theseus, the king of Athens. Many of these heroes are not best pleased about having a woman in their party. But Meliager, who has the mad hots for our starring lady, tells them to get stuffed and get over it because she's coming along. Off they march, and things get tragic quickly. The boar slices open several members of the party, and then in the confusion some of the hunters accidentally kill each other. But Atalanta keeps her cool. Turns out that she is braver and more skillful with a spear than any of them, and so she's the one who hits the boar first. Later, a besotted and very impressed Meliager presents her with the boar's head as a trophy. Apparently, in ancient Greek art, presenting someone with an animal's carcass or a severed head is a highly erotic gesture. Sexy. But the other hunters are not happy. It's a disgrace, they say, for a woman to take home the top prize. Jealous much? So Meliager gets frustrated and kills a few of them. And later on, some of them kill him, and it's all just, well, very messy. When Jason and his Argonauts go sailing to look for the Golden Fleece, Atalanta offers to go with them. And though they could badly use her expertise, Jason says no, fearing his men's reactions. So Atalanta says, Whatever, losers! And goes home to her long-lost father and mother. They're very proud to have her back, despite the whole leaving her in the woods to die business. But this is ancient Greece, so they aren't keen on her staying single. Atalanta values her freedom, though, so she sets some conditions. She'll marry someone, sure, but only after they best her in a foot race. She'll even give them a head start. Isn't that generous? If they win, she'll walk down the aisle with them. But if she wins, then it's off with his head. Head chopping notwithstanding, many men step up to try and win this wily, beautiful huntress, but no one can seem to do it. She's just too fast. Heads are rolling. So when amorous hopeful Hipponymy steps up to the plate, he knows he's going to need some divine intervention. He gets the goddess Aphrodite to give him three golden, magically irresistible apples, which he drops along the trail in hopes that Atalanta will feel compelled to stop for a bite. That she does several times, but even so, he barely beats her. But beat her he does, and she isn't too mad about it. So far, we've seen some familiar ancient themes at play here. Atalanta is an object of desire, attractive particularly because she's a wild thing. But in the end, we see her tamed. Because we can't let her be strong, sexy, and independent. But here's the thing about her union with Hipponymes. It falls well outside of ancient Greek norms. It's fitting that the name Atalanta means balance or equal, because she and her husband are equals. They hunt together, scheme together, and have wild rolls in the hay on their travels. Until one day when they decide to get amorous in a sacred grove, and an angry god turns them both into lions. Scholars from medieval times see her fate as some kind of divine punishment for being too free, both sexually and in general, because lions never mate with their own kinds. Wrong again, medieval scholars. Perhaps her fate is more a gift than a punishment, a chance to be the wild, free thing she always wanted, hunting with her beloved for eternity. In a society where women are supposed to stay at home and dedicate themselves to the domestic sphere, there's no room for a real-life Atalanta. 
And yet she's very popular in Greece, depicted over and over again on vases and the sides of men's favorite wine amphorae. The racetrack she's famous for beating so many suitors on is actually a tourist attraction, as is the altar at her birthplace, where people pay homage by leaving boar tusks on the altar. She's also a popular subject on women's perfume bottles and vases designed as wedding gifts. Atalanta's often depicted wearing next to nothing a loincloth and the ancient version of a sports bra. And she's often wearing clothing associated with the nomadic tribes that the Greeks describe as Scythians, horse-riding peoples who roam the great grass seas of the Eurasian steppes. The Greeks tend to fetishize such women. On many of their tiny cameo rings, set with jewels carved with intricate scenes meant to be enjoyed by the wearer and their friends, show Amazons being subjugated by heroes, dresses falling off to reveal their more personal attributes. We've found a few alabaster vases that show a Greek youth courting an Amazon maiden, one with the inscription, O Pais Kalos, or The Boy is Hot. Some art, clearly meant for private consumption, shows nude Amazons in suggestive positions. One of Atalanta, pleasuring Meliager with her lips, was last seen hanging suggestively over the bed of Roman Emperor Tiberius. Later, Emperor Nero develops a fondness for a bronze Amazon statue called Lovely Legs that he carts around with him everywhere. Oh, Nero. But maybe, much like the Amazonian Wonder Woman is for us today, the Amazons are hero figures to ancient Greek women. A reminder that the ladies have a deep well of strength to draw from, even if they can't do it holding a spear. At the very least, they are a subject of general fascination, a window into the life they might have had if they'd only been born a thousand miles to the east or to the north. Amazons from outside Greece show up in a lot of stories. They tend to ride in from foreign lands to tangle with the mighty heroes of myth. Some accounts of the Trojan War say that the mighty warrior Achilles fell in love with the Amazon Penthesilea right in the midst of battle, and while in the act of trying to kill her. Penthesilea had fought like a raging leopard, said Quintus of Smyrna in The Fall of Troy. Her valor and beauty were undimmed by dust and blood. Achilles' heart lurched with remorse and desire. All the Greeks on the battlefield crowded around and marveled, wishing with all their hearts that their wives at home could be just like her. Of course, it's easy to wish your wife was like a raging leopard when she's no longer capable of brandishing a spear at you. There's also the story of Theseus, king of Athens, who murders the great Amazon warrior Melanippe and kidnaps Antiope from the southern Black Sea coast, bringing her home with him to walk on down the aisle, which Herodotus thinks is fine. In my opinion, abducting young women is wrong, but it is stupid to make a fuss about it after the event. It is obvious that no young woman allows herself to be abducted if she does not wish to be. Come on, man. This outrage prompts the Amazons to get together and march on Athens, surrounding them so no one can get in or out. For months, battle rages around the city. Where is Antiope during the battle, you wonder? Some versions say that, well and truly suffering from Stockholm Syndrome, she fights dutifully along her stab-worthy husband. But others say she dumps that asshat and joins up with her Amazon friends. These stories the Greeks concocted about foreign warrior women tell us a lot about how they feel about them. They tend to involve a great man slaying them, putting these man-killers from the edges of civilization right in their place. But they're not depicted as monsters. Ancient Greek myth has plenty of those. In fact, they're described as heroic. We've found more than 500 vases with Amazons on them, and almost none of them show one begging for her life. They're even shown as desirable, a kind of hero, despite the fact that they have lady parts. Though in the myths, they often have to die in the end. But they show up in other civilizations' myths too, often with more satisfactorily amorous endings. They crop up in North Africa, China, Eurasia, Persia, India, and Egypt, suggesting that warrior women are a favorite theme across cultures. In Iranian tradition, we have a Saka warrior woman by the name of Zarina or Zaraniya, which means golden, who supposedly lived during the time of the Median Empire. This leader of warrior women is more beautiful and daring than any of them, considered a hero for how many enemies she slays. 
The Parthians and the Saka team up when they break away from the Median Empire, and Zarina marries their king, named Murmurus, to seal the deal. In a bloody battle against the Median warrior Striangus, he knocks her off her horse. He then either a. is so struck by her beauty that he lets her remount and gallop away, or b. injures her and she runs away too fast for him to catch her. Later, when Murmurus captures Striangus, Zarina begs him to be kind, since he let her go earlier, but he's not having any of it. So she helps the captive escape, who promptly turns around with some disgruntled Medeans and kills the king. R.I.P. Murmurus. Once all this madness has died down a little, Striangus goes to visit her in a beautiful city called Roxanaki. She kisses him openly and rides in his chariot, which causes him to burn with desire. After a lot of pacing and poetry writing, he finally confesses his feelings, and she's like, Oh, well, that's nice, but you have a very pretty wife and a whole lot of concubines. I mean, what would they say? So he goes away sulking, about ready to kill himself over the whole humiliation. But he makes sure to write Serena a mean letter before he goes. We don't actually know the end of the story, but we do know that Serena for sure had the upper hand. In Egypt, we have the story of Amazon Queen Serpet and Egyptian Prince Petikons, which takes place around the 7th century BCE. Apparently, this prince invades her all-woman territory of Kor, or Assyria, and they settle down uneasily to camp near each other. Serpet, whose name in Egyptian means Blue Lotus and who's referred to as a pharaoh, calls her ladies into her tent and is like, We need to pray to our girl Isis, and sends one of her best lady scouts, Ashteshit, to go a spying. Dressed as a man, she works her way into their camp without incident, and her intel helps Serpet devise a plan. They attack on horseback and in chariots, all with scary-looking breastplates, and they call out curses and taunts in the language of warriors. Finding himself being roundly embarrassed, Petticons challenges Serpet to a one-on-one -on -one battle. They go at it all day long, until the sun starts to set and she's like, Listen, we can fight again tomorrow. And he says, panting furiously, <sighs> Yeah, okay. I mean, no one likes fighting in the dark. They start to strip off their armor, get a good look at each other, and are like, Um, um hello, sexy. sexy. Then spend the next few hours getting to know each other. Nothing says I'm into you like trying and failing to stab each other in the heart. The next day they fight again and eventually make peace with each other. And when some other army shows up, they fight it together. We don't have an ending for this one either, but it seems like some steamy time under a tree is likely. And then there's the Chinese legend of Mulan. When her father is conscripted, she decides he's too old for that soldiering life, so she chops off her hair and rides off in his place. For 10 to 12 years, she fights bravely in her manly disguise, only to eventually meet up with the emperor. She tells him she doesn't want any of his fancy titles or court appointments. In one later version of the story, he discovers she's a gal and says he'll be totally glad to make her his concubine, an offer she emphatically declines. She just wants a fast horse to spirit her back home, where she puts on her old clothes and slaps on some makeup and goes back to the life of a lady. These tales give us not only strong women, but ones capable of being lovers and fighters at the same time. Take this passage from the Nart Saga from the Caucasus, stories that form part of an oral tradition that comes from ancient Scythia. In olden times, the earth thundered with the pounding of horses' hooves. In that long ago age, women would saddle their horses, grab their lances, and ride forth with their menfolk to meet the enemy in battle on the steppes. The women of that time could cut out an enemy's heart with their swift, sharp swords, yet they also comforted their men and harbored great love in their hearts. Most of what we've covered so far are fictional stories, though most Greek writers treat the Battle of Athens as historical facts. They fully believe that some long-ago Amazons actually attacked them. But they hint at two things, that the ancients are quite fascinated by warrior women, and that there are enough real, flesh-and-blood women who help inspire the stories. We 
know now that there were women who lived just like the Amazons, hunting and riding, fighting and living on par with all the men in their midst. The Greeks call them Scythians, a loose, shifting term for the many different nomadic tribes that live around the Black Sea and to the west, north, and east. These fierce nomads live on the Eurasian steppes, extending over thousands of miles through Thrace, Anatolia, Syria, and Medea, across the Caucasus Mountains and the Caspian Sea, and extending all the way to China. In today's geography, we're talking Iran, Armenia, India, Russia, Siberia, all of the stands, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, etc., Russia, and Mongolia. The Persians and Chinese have their own names for them, Saka and Yongnu. Their way of life on the steppes goes strong from the 6th century BCE to about 500 CE. Archaeological studies on the Eurasian steppes have uncovered, quite literally, a whole bunch of ancient mounds or graves called Kurgans, many dating back to the time of the Greeks, more than 1,000 tombs across ancient Scythia and the Eurasian steppes. And while scholars once peeked into them, saw swords, and were like, yup, this guy was definitely a dude. DNA allows us to be a little less sexist. One of every three or four of these nomad women were buried with weapons, warriors in life, and honored as such in death. Based on what we've found so far, lady warriors represent some 37% of warrior burials. Analyzing their bodies tell us a lot about how they lived and died. Many had wounds that must have been given to them by some kind of weapon. Unless the ladies regularly took spears to each other in the cooking tent, it's pretty clear they died in battle. In 2004, we even found two Scythian women buried in Roman Britain, buried with their horses, bits of ivory, and their swords. Which suggests that Amazon-like women were allowed to join the Roman army, which is kind of mind-blowing. But who were these women, and what did their lives actually look like? Most of these tribes didn't leave any written evidence of their cultures, so piecing it all together involves sifting through story and rumor, legend and poem, and some of the practices that have survived out on the Eurasian steppes. In our hunt for the Amazon women, it's important to remember that the Greeks aren't always the most reliable sources. Remember when you used to play telephone? How you'd whisper something from ear to ear that started out as something like, I like bananas, and always turned into some version of, somebody farted? The ancient Greek stories about Amazons are kind of like that. Very few scholars spent time amongst them, so we have very little eyewitness reports from them on these nomadic cultures. Their stories come from people traveling down to Greece from the northeast, traders, explorers, even slaves, bought and brought home from these faraway lands. And the so-called Scythians aren't just one people, but a whole bunch of tribes that probably speak different languages and have different cultural practices. Since most people in Greece don't speak those languages, their stories come to us through many layers of twisted whispers. Though we do have a friend in Herodotus, the 5th century writer from Halicarnassus tucked into the Persian Empire near the coast of modern-day Turkey. He actually observes and writes about Scythians, giving us what are some of the only up-close and personal accounts of their lives. Luckily, there are plenty of ancient Greeks ready to jump in and sensationalize the Amazon story. Their fanciful facts about warrior women still confuse our view of them today. For example, Diodorus of Sicily writes in the 60s BCE about how Scythian bands are often ruled by women who train for war just like the men, and in acts of manly courage they are in no way inferior to the men. But he takes it a step further, saying that one Amazon queen near Pontus on the Black Sea coast enacted laws forming a gynocracy where women would always rule the day. Women went to war, he tells us, and the men stayed at home and sat behind the spindle. Baby girls had one breast seared off to prep them for using a bow and arrow, while baby boys had their legs maimed. Okay. Such writers give us the Wonder Woman version of the Amazon story. They live in all-female bands, loyal only to each other and vicious to outsiders, particularly if they happen to have man parts. They roam vast, endless grasslands, almost never getting off their horses, honing their incredible aim by shooting at gemstones and coating their arrows with step viper venom, just itching for some man to happen by. They either hate men, according to these stories, or they use them for their 
own sensual purposes. And they use the skulls of their enemies as drinking vessels. All right. Even the term Amazon has a confused and foggy history. We're not even sure where the word comes from. It's definitely not Greek, but a loan word from another language. The Greeks could have taken the word from several languages. The Circassian name Amezane, meaning forest or moon mother. The ancient Iranian Hamazon, meaning warriors. Or, according to another linguist, husbandless. It first appears in the Iliad as Amazonas Antineri, and we aren't sure what it actually means. It doesn't have a feminine ending, which dashes the idea that they're a female-only club. The Greeks tend to highlight whatever is most unique about a particular group of people in their naming, which is why we have that second word, Antianeri. Taken together, we think it might mean Amazons, the tribe whose women are equals, or Amazons, the equals. And the Greeks call that out because it's so outside their norm. But enough of legend. Let's leave these old Greek writers behind and step into the grasslands, waking up into the life of a Scythian. But first, I want to introduce you to some friends of mine. Hippolyta and her golden belt. Atalanta and her golden apples. Penthesilia and the fall of Troy. Why were the ancient Greeks so obsessed with these strong, mythical Amazons? And who were the real-life warrior women next door who inspired these myths? I'm Jen McMenemy. And I'm Jenny Williamson. We run a podcast called Ancient History Fangirl. And in our three-part series on the Amazons, we take you from the mythic roots of Greek Amazon stories to the warrior women of ancient Scythia and separate the truth from legend. Then we talk about the lives of five real warrior queens and generals who tore it up on the ancient battlefield. Check us out at ancienthistoryfangirl.com. After you listen to this episode from the Explorers, of course. Much of what we know about our lives as Amazon-like warrior women comes from stories written down by people outside their cultures and from examinations of their burial mounds. We have tons of information to sift through, though. Enough to piece together what life for an ancient Scythian woman might look like. Though it's hard for us to spend a comprehensive day as an Amazon because we're talking about a whole bunch of individual tribes, all with different languages, customs, and beliefs. They go by many names, Sarmatians, Masagate, Cimmerians, Parthians, Saka. But there are a few things that ancients agree on. All of these groups are nomadic, roaming with their horses over vast, open grasslands. Lured on by pastures, says Roman geographer Pomponius Mella. They live in camps and carry all their possessions and wealth with them. Archery, horseback riding, and hunting are a girl's pursuits. We Scythians don't tend to stay in one place for long. One ancient historian said that these Warlike tribes have no cities, no fixed abodes. They live free and unconquered, so savage that even the women take part in war. We're always roaming, hunting, herding, raising horses, coming together for festivals and funerals, and, yes, sometimes to stab a man or two. And that's the key to the Scythian woman's freedom, compared to Greek women. Their way of life demands equality and makes room for women to step up and take an active role. The steps are made up mostly of grasses, stretching for thousands of miles, exposed and lacking much vegetation. If the graves of ancient steppe people have anything to tell us, it's that this nomadic life is hard. Analysis shows skeletons with many broken bones and dislocations, probably from falling off horses, and hurts clearly made by a sharp blade or arrow. For those who live to a ripe old age, they probably go to the grave with a limp. This challenging nomadic lifestyle means that everyone has to contribute and be flexible about their roles. Men and women both are buried with spindle whirls, baking supplies, bows, and arrows, suggesting they share the load in terms of who's hunting down dinner and who's cleaning the tent. The Greeks are shocked by how much time Scythian women spend out and about. They keep no watch over maidens, Herodotus tells us, hand firmly over mouth, and leave them altogether free. But the true key to our freedom and equality has to do with the light of our lives, our horses. We don't know exactly when we first domesticated horses, but we think it happened around 3500 BCE in Kazakhstan and the Ukraine. In other words, the places where we so-called Scythians live. The importance of the bond between us and our horses can't be overstated. 
In a time before cars or engines, they pull our wagons and chariots. They enable us to travel long distances. They ride with us into raids and wars. They give us sustenance and supplies. Horsehair, which is as strong a rope as you're likely to find. Hooves, meat, and milk. Sometimes fermented to make an alcoholic concoction called kumis. In short, we worship our horses and are often buried with them. Our kurgans are full of riding equipment. Harnesses, bridles, and many pieces of art in which horses play a central role. They have their own legends, too, and riders are often known by their horse's name rather than their own. Amazon names reflect how much we love them. Hippolyta, which means releases the horses, Hipponike, which means victory steed, and Xanthippe, which means palomino. As a modern-day horse lover from way back, this is a feature of Scythian life I can get on board with. While we're speaking of names, can we pause to enjoy a few others? Many are Greek, preserved on their vases and paintings, but they're evocative and fairly badass. Lycopis, or Wolf Eyes, Antianira, or Man's Match, Aella, or Whirlwind, Chirope, or Fierce Gaze. Yes, honey! But some of the names found on ancient Greek vases have turned out to be in their original language, and I am sure to butcher them, but I'll do my best. Pukpapis, or worthy of armor. Kasa, or one who heads a council. And gloriously, Kepis, or hot flanks. You tell them, sister, loud and proud. But back to our horses. There's a highly coveted breed of horse called the Akalteke that bear a striking resemblance to the Scythian horses painted onto the sides of clay pots. They first appear in Central Asia, known for shiny coats, small hooves, and an elegant build. The Scythians take care breeding and caring for their noble steeds. Big deal kings and emperors wage wars to try and win themselves these fast, steady, famous horses. In 339 BCE, ancient writer Justin tells us, Alexander the Great's dad, Philip II, is so keen that he kidnaps 20,000 of them, plus 20,000 women and children, just for funsies. Not smart, Philly. On the way back to Macedon, he's attacked by another Thracian Scythian tribe, getting his leg skewered by a spear and his horse killed for his trouble. The great man loses every one of his captives, horses included. I mean, mess with a Scythian and that's what you get. Like a baby caribou in the Canadian tundra, all Scythians have to learn how to ride as soon as they're physically able. Otherwise, they're never going to keep up with the herd. And unlike, say, carrying giant bags of grain or wielding a very heavy axe, horseback riding is a truly great equalizer. Being good at it isn't about what biological parts you have, which means that women aren't at a disadvantage in terms of brute strength. And so, in a horse riding culture, women are valued and as important as men, and equal with them. And that never fails to get the Greeks all hot and bothered. This equality seems to extend to our trusty steeds as well. Some writers say that Scythians prefer riding female horses into battle because, as Pliny tells us, They can urinate while galloping. I have never seen a female horse do this, but we're gonna have to take his word for it. If you're a little nervous about all this galloping off into the sunset, here's a tip for you. The key to the relationship between horse and rider is touch. Research about the relationship between us and our equine friends shows that we use a delicate and complex language to communicate, turning physical connection into emotional understanding. Horses feel our bodies move and understand how we're feeling, and vice versa. We Scythians know this to be true because we don't use stirrups or a saddle. We'll either sit on a simple felt blanket or ride bareback. If you've never done this, I can tell you with confidence that it requires skill, nerves of steel, a healthy dose of confidence, and a good relationship with your horse. Those are the only things keeping you from face planting into those long, spiky grasses. Luckily, we've taught our horses to kneel on command. That means they can get down low so we can mount even if we're injured. Especially helpful when you have no stirrups to hoist yourself up on. But before we ride, we'll need to get dressed. While we're prancing around our tent in our all-together, let's talk about breasts. 
because when it comes to Amazons, we kind of have to. A rumor has been floating around since antiquity that Amazon women chop off one of their lady orbs so as to make shooting a bow and arrow easier. The ancients even say that the name Amazon is bound up in breasts. Look at the word Amazones. Because A means without, and mazos is similar to the Greek word mastos, the theory goes, the name actually means something like breastless. Some ancient writers even say that Amazon mothers burn young girls' breasts right off with an iron tool in order to make them, as Pomponius Mella has it, ready for action, able to withstand blows to the chest like men. Others suggest that the young, budding breast is just pinched right off. Hate to tell you boys, but that theory makes you seem like you're not overly familiar with the mechanics of a lady's Christmas ornaments. Think about this theory for, say, five seconds, and you'll see how little sense it makes, particularly if you've ever shot a bow and arrow. If you have, you'll know that you have to turn sideways to shoot and pull the string back to around your chin. Which means that breasts don't get in the way of good marksmanship. Sure, if you've got a whole lot of breasts to deal with, you might have to adjust your style a little, but they're never going to keep you from being an expert shot. And yet the Greeks and Romans all repeat this single-breasted idea, sinking their heels in for all of time. It could be that the Greeks misunderstand Amazon outfits. There's evidence to suggest that some ladies from the steppe wear leather armor in their youth to bind down their breasts, making riding and shooting easier. I mean, you try riding a trotting horse without strapping those ladies down. In Greek vase paintings, Amazons tend to be shown wearing men's armor, which doesn't exactly show off womanly curves. Do the Greeks see steppe women wearing leather armor and get confused about what they have going on underneath? Here's another thing about boobs and armor. In modern culture, we often show women warriors like Wonder Woman and the fabulous Cena wearing boob armor. You know, those things that show off a lady's assets by creating an iron cup for them to rest in. Those make it very clear that breasts are at play, but they make zero sense from a practical standpoint. Most armor comes to a slight point facing out over the chest, as that means any weapon that strikes it is likely to slide off to either side, keeping it away from vital organs. Boob armor is like an open invitation to an eager sword to get familiar with your sternum. It would serve as a well for pointy things to fall into, and no serious warrior would be caught dead wearing that. While we're still in the buff, let's talk about another contentious feature of our bodies, tattoos. Herodotus says the tribes of Thrace, to the northeast of Greece, feel strongly about body art. They think not having any speaks to a lack of identity. Philosopher Sextus Empiricus tells us that most get their first tattoo when they're young. Clearchus of Soli, who travels widely through Thrace, says they decorate themselves all over their bodies using the tongues of their belt buckles, or pins of brooches, as needles. Whew, that's hardcore. As you look down at the horse tattoo twisting artfully across your ribs, you remember the experience. How the design was traced on with a leather stencil, then someone bundled together a bunch of tiny needles and turned us into a human pincushion. After that, they rubbed in some ash-based pigment mixed with tallow, berry juice, or indigo for color, along with some sap of ox bile to make it set. Yummy. The Greeks are fairly weirded out by such permanent decoration, but to us Scythians, they're a mark of beauty and social standing. Animals are a favorite theme. Horses, antler deer, tigers, imaginary beasts like griffins, all twisted and contorted into incredible shapes and artful angles. And though we have accounts of men having tattoos, they seem particularly tied to the ladies. Archaeologists have unearthed tattoo-covered female forms made of clay on the steppe and Neolithic horse bones carved to look like a woman's torso, also covered in swirling designs. And then there's the mummy we call the Ice Princess. In 1993, on the Ukok Plateau in Russia, researchers will find a tomb left untouched for 2,500 years. It will contain a large wood coffin decorated all over with large deer, and inside, a perfectly frozen warrior woman with a prominent blue tattoo. In 2003, we'll discover other mummified Scythian bodies with tattoos still worked into their skin, revealed by that modern wonder that is infrared. Before we pull on clothes, we might oil up with the juice of a plant called halinda, which is said to help protect us from the elements. Life on the steppe can get mighty cold. 
Its analgesic qualities also may help with our arthritis, common to a people who spend most of their lives on and falling off of horses. As we dress, we might put on a range of jewelry, depending on our purpose. We roam far, we Scythians, trading with cultures far and wide, and our art reflects this. We might wear gold rings or earrings, bits of jade, even bracelets made of fox teeth, and then gaze at ourselves in bronze mirrors to make sure we're looking fly. The Ice Princess was buried with a silk wrap, a huge headdress, and thigh-high embroidered boots. Killing it in the afterlife. Reports vary on what exactly we'll be wearing. Herodotus says the Thracians wear foxskin caps, tunics, colorful cloaks, and fawnskin boots. Guys like Plutarch suggest that much of our clothes are made out of animal skin, while Roman historian Ammianus Marcellinus says we wear a hemp tunic and leggings made out of rodent and goatskin. Rat leggings, anyone? Those'll go over great in your Sunday morning yoga class. It's likely we'll wear leather to protect us from the cold and for riding. In Greek art, a common feature of our outfits are our pointy felt caps and long sleeve tunics, along with a belt and some splashes of gold, because obviously. If our grave goods are anything to go by, we like to deck our horses and ourselves out in things that are very shiny. It's likely that, much to the ancient Greeks' consternation, we'll be wearing pants. It makes sense that Scythian girls and boys alike grow up in them, as they help protect our skin from the wear and tear of riding, and they're practical for a life where everyone's expected to hunt and work. We don't know when pants first appear on the ancient scene. The earliest trousers we know of were dug up in the Terim Basin, dating to 1200 to 900 CE. But the Greeks give Amazon women credit for their invention, which may be one of the reasons they find these women so upsetting. A Lost History by Helicano says that a great Persian queen named Atassa is the first one to wear them. Disguising her feminine nature, Atassa ruled over many tribes and was most warlike and brave in every deed. Semiramis, whose legend dates to around the 9th century BCE, is also said to tell all of her subjects to wear pants in an attempt to blur any distinctions between men and women. Pants, a great liberator and practical for a life on the move. This is a huge deal to the Greeks. First, because they make it hard to tell who's male and who isn't, which, of course, is deeply upsetting. Second, and most interesting of all, because the Greeks consider pants effeminate. Even Alexander the Great, huge fan of adopting styles of dress from other cultures, refuses to wear them. Yes, because that Grecian mini-dress and no-underwear situation you're riding around in makes so much more sense. Chafing much? Our pants are made of all sorts of materials. Leather, wool, flax, hemp, even silk. Hugh Hefner would no doubt approve. Though the silk is probably worn under other, hardier layers. Which is good because if our promiscuous reputation is anything to go by, we'll be peeling those bad boys off for someone later. pants on and shiny ponies ready, we'll leave our Amazon day for now. Next week, we'll dive into some other aspects of our lives as Scythian women, from hunting and battle to what we do for fun, including open-air nude frolicking and marijuana saunas. And we'll meet some of the historical women who fueled the Amazon myth and gave women warriors such a fearsome reputation. Until next time. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, consider becoming a patron. It makes all the difference in the world to an indie podcaster like me. You'll be helping to keep the show alive, and you'll get access to exclusive bonus episodes, sneak peeks, behind-the-scenes goodies, and more. Just go to my website and click on Become a Patron. And don't forget to check out the brand new Explores shop where you'll find greeting cards, posters, and other women's histories goodies. To check out the lady-centric ancient Greek timeline and map I made you, go to this episode's show notes on my website. There you'll also find a transcript, a list of my research sources, music credits, and lots of pictures. Speaking of pictures, check me out on Instagram at The Explores Podcast, on Facebook, or on Twitter at The Explores Pod. 
A special shout out to Adrian Mayer, whose book, The Amazons, Lives and Legends of Warrior Women, made this episode possible. If you're interested in reading more about ancient Scythians, that's the place to start. The music you just enjoyed comes courtesy of Michael B. Levy, who composes all of his work on recreated lyres of antiquity, giving us a special insight into what ancient music might have sounded like. All songs were provided and licensed by AKMProductionsInc.com, and you can find links to his work in the show notes. A special thanks to the following podcast legends who kindly contributed their vocal stylings. Nathan from Queen's Podcast, who will make you laugh and cry over badass women from history. Jen and Jenny from Ancient History Fangirl, which takes you deep into the stories of the ancient world. And Sean from Stories of Your and Yours, who tells you classic stories in the most soothing voice you'll ever hear. Their podcasts are some of my very favorites, so check them out. You'll find links to their work in the show notes. Thanks also to the kind friends and family who never fail to delight me with their voiceovers. Caitlin Seifert, Phil Chevalier, John Armstrong, Avery Downing, and Andrew Goldman. Thanks, as always, to Paul Gablonski, a.k.a. Mr. Explores, for my theme music and logo, and all the amazing pieces of art we've been collaborating on this season. I'd pick up my Spartan sword for you any day. 